everyone. Welcome to Avaya's Healthy Aging Curriculum. I'm Andy Anderson. My partner, Ike Allen, and I are teachers, mentors, and the co-owners of Avaya University. Avaya is the creator of over a thousand books, films, courses, teachings, and other supportive resources. Thank you so much for joining us. Our fellow teacher, Michael Edson, is here today to talk with you about natural Parkinson's support, ways to keep your brain healthy naturally. Michael is an author and co-founder and president of Natural Eye Care, Inc. Thank you so much for being here with us, Michael. Hello there. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And I'd love it if you just kind of get us started telling us a little bit about your story. How did you get into the work that you do today? Well, when I was 41, I went back to school uh, after many, many years uh, to get my acupuncture license. And I was also working full time. It was a program that enabled us to go at night and weekends, still work, work full time. And that was about three years. And while I was still in, in school, Dr. Grossman, who you interviewed the other day, who's my partner in natural eye care, had written his third book on natural eye care. And um, by the time the book was published, it was six months later and there was new material out there. So he asked me if I wanted to set up a website and keep people current on the latest in uh, natural eye care. And that was 18 years ago. Mm. and become the leading holistic site for uh, natural eye care on the internet where we work with people every day, helping them guide them to the things that uh, would be most valuable to helping them preserve vision for different eye issues or even prevention. So um, the, the, I've co-written all the books. Um, I've co-written two of the books with Dr. Gosling. One is for practitioners, but the latest book, we had written early last year, it was called Natural Eye Care, Your Guide to Healthy Vision and Healing. That was a big project. That was an 800 page book covering over 2000 peer reviewed research studies, citations on nutrition and vision, as well as going to diet exercise. And we're gonna talk more about that uh, for Parkinson's, uh, as well as the antioxidants, Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, yoga, and quite a bit more. So what was interesting to me, or really fascinating, is that I, I, I had the time to do most of the research for this book, and the number of um, relationships between the nutrients that help support eye health and actually cross the blood-brain barrier. And when they're deficient, they can actually, among other issues, um, cause brain disease and cell death. And that can lead to Parkinson's potentially, Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia, Huntington's disease, Wilson's disease, even MS. So my, my uh, wife's grandfather passed away from Parkinson's. So, and I also have family members that have had Alzheimer's and dementia. So I've been interested in this field for a long time. So I decided to accumulate all that data that I had gathered for the Natural Eye Care book and started to organize it for two more books. Uh, the, the Parkinson's is the one that just came out recently. And that's the one we're going to be discussing today that goes into uh, many different aspects of brain health that's not covered by the medical, tradi the traditional medical community, but can be causative to Parkinson's or contributing to Parkinson's. The next book I have, which I've written already, but I need to go through editing, is on Alzheimer's dementia and dementia. And that has over 3,000 peer reviewed research citations on nutrition, Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine all things diet, exercise, all things we're, we're going to be talking about today. Um, so the idea of this book is to, for me, I wanted to expand the conversation. The research is out there. Uh, Chinese medicine goes back 3,000 years. Uh, the base of Chinese medicine, part of it anyway, is to look at the person as a unique individual. So if you have, a, if five people come to me with the same problem, with the same diagnosis, they may all get, end up getting different treatments because the dynamics of what's going on in the body may be different from person to person. So um, the medical community focuses primarily on the symptoms and they're gonna give you drugs that help. Uh, well, and let's go back and talk about uh, what Parkinson's is and then we can go into that part of it. Yes, please. So Parkinson's is the second leading neurological disease next to Alzheimer's in the world. And in the United States, we have over a million uh, people suffering from Parkinson's, United States and Canada, with over another 50,000 per year being diagnosed. So it's a really significant problem. Um, the interesting thing is that Parkinson's is not actually usually diagnosed until 60 to 
of dopamine is lost. So dopamine is a critical neurotransmitter that keeps our mind healthy and functioning and also controls motor coordination and ultimately tremors as well we get if they, we have a lack of dopamine. So again, um, the levodopa, the cardidopa, other medications that the drug company, that the, that the doctors give are trying to, to create more dopamine in the body that's being lost by lost what's called dopaminergic cells in the, primarily in the substantia nigra part of the brain. Um, so trying to build that up to replace what's lost and try and reduce the symptoms, which can be very helpful for a period of time, but they also have tremendous side effects, potentially. Uh, there's a whole page of side effects, including even hallucinations and worsening of the symptoms, um, anxiety, depression, sleeping disorders, dry mouth, it goes on and on and on. So um, I'm not at all advocating not to do the medication. What I am advocating, though, is to take a step back and look at the contributing factors that maybe the medical community is not looking at in terms of what could be causing uh, Parkinson's disease and trying to address it from a natural approach as well to try and minimize the amount of medication that's needed and trying to, to take a whole body approach to what is going on with that particular person. So like at this stage of the game in the research, is it actually like a totally a preventable disease? Is it preventable in some people? Like what, where, where are we at with that? I don't know much about it. Well, the interesting thing is um, I think it is preventable for many people. Um, there's something called genetics and we're born with genes. And uh, it was thought that the genes for many years until the 1990s, that the genes that we were born with, was going to determine not only what we look like and how we function, but the diseases we would have. But in fact, there's something called epigenetics. And they found that how we're raised and how we're nourished early on and, and uh, environmental and lifestyle considerations actually affect what genes get turned on and off. Mm -hmm. So in fact, there may be a large population of people with genetic tendencies towards a Parkinson's that don't end up getting it because they have a, a nourishing lifestyle. Now, again, I'm qualifying that there's some people with genetically, they're going to get it no matter what. But I think there's also many people that can potentially prevent it or if they have Parkinson's can reduce the symptoms and manage it um, in a very natural way as well. Mm -hmm. So um, I wanted to take a look at um, the book covers over 15 categories. What I did was I looked at over 50 antioxidants to start with. And again, these have peer re research citations in the, neuro neuro the neurologist journals that is not really being, I don't think is really part of the medical model of how they're evaluating and treating from what I can tell. And so there, within that, there are 15 categories I created because many of these nutrients cover many things they do in the brain. So we want to talk about what might be contributing to or causing dopaminergic cells from dying. Dopaminergic cells are part of the chain of producing dopamine in the body. So the medical community is not necessarily looking at that. You know, what are the, very, what are the factors? And I'm also looking at those 15 categories or inflammation, which nutrients reduce the symptoms, cognitive functioning, um, apoptosis, cell death, mitochondria. Mitochondria are the cells in the body and they're the, they're the um, energy batteries in our cells. And when that's dysfunctional, that can cause cell death and neuron death. And, uh, and so as can inflammation. Uh, what are the dietary considerations? So there's 15 different categories that I have mapped out. And some of the nutrients like curcumin do everything, cover all the categories or exercise, ashwagandha, there's many ginseng that do many things within the brain to help, help protect the brain cells from dying and helping nourish the brain cells. This also is something called neurogenesis. Okay, so uh, neurogenesis, actually let me back up and talk about epigenetics, I didn't finish with that. And so they did a switch, they did a study on rats and they, they had um, genetically designed those rats to be obese. And every generation after that, uh, the rats were obese. 
they took the, the, the last generation and they nurtured them, they petted them, they sang to them, they fed them really healthy diets, they played music. And that generation was not only obese, but all the following generations are not obese as well. Mm. And then there's studies on twins where they've been brought up in different environments. And one twin will have the disease that the genetically prone to one will not. So how we're nourished when we're children, particularly, and any trauma we, we face, and how we're, how we're fed, what kind of diet we have, uh, and environmental influences around us, all affect, we have this innate intelligence with us, to some extent, what genes get turned on and off to uh, cause or increase the risk, let's say, of onset of disease. So then we were talking about neurogenesis. They also thought that the brain cells that we were born with is what we were died with, that we died, you know, what we would die with. And in fact, um, they found out that, that we produce new brain cells all through life until we die. It's called neurogenesis. So we can actually replace lost brain cells. And there's a, a, a number of nutrients that I discuss in the book that, that promote neurogenesis for the brain overall for Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. Um, so that's another category. Uh, in terms of uh, Parkinson's, I'm a little all over the place here, but um, the ultimate thing that doctors look at, of course, is um, something called an a, a aggregation folding of alpha-synuclein in a substantial nigra part of the brain. And alpha-synuclein has a lot of essential properties that keep our brain healthy. Uh, they're, they're critical for, for uh, neurotransmission, how the, the brain cells uh, communicate with each other, uh, brain plasticity, um, also even neurogenesis. So, uh, but when that protein overproduces or aggregates, it folds and creates something called Lewy bodies, and that ends up um, causing neuron and dopaminergic neuron death. And so also some of the drugs are trying to reduce the alpha-synuclein buildup, but there's also a number of nutrients that do that naturally. Um, so what, why might these, uh, and in Alzheimer's, it's, there's a lot of relationship between the two diseases, although the pathophysiology of the brain and the parts of the brain affected are slightly different. So um, there's beta amyloid buildup and neurofibrillary fiber buildup and tau protein buildup in um, Alzheimer's, but again, it's a protein buildup as well uh, in both diseases. So um, we want to talk about, for instance, environment. You know, what are we exposed to in the environment? Okay. And what, um, you know, are we exposed to metals? You know, are we exposed to arsenic and lead and mercury? And how does that affect our brain? They're very toxic to, to the brain cells. Um, we have something called a blood-brain barrier. And the blood-brain barrier um, helps prevent things we don't want getting to the brain getting there. And that could be metals, that could be a uh, form of uh, pathogens, bacteria, viruses, mold, those sort of things. So if that is compromised, and we're going to talk about some things that, that cause that to be compromised as well, um, then we're more prone to having uh, cell death. Uh, we want to talk about stress. How does chronic stress affect the brain? So that puts us in a flight and fight mode. If we are under, in, we were designed to handle stress uh, under acute situations um, and not the normal daily stress that people go home and still thinking about work and are still feeling the stress in relationships. And that keeps us in a flight and fight mode instead of allowing us to, to relax and repair. And that stress creates a, a tremendous amount of free radicals. Uh, free radicals are um, molecules that have uh, a missing electron in the outer orbit. So they will seek another electron and pull it from a healthy cell. So if we don't have uh, uh, antioxidants to neutralize, the antioxidants have an, ele an extra electron. So they will attach themselves to the free radicals and they will eliminate it. And that keeps us safe from the damage to that. And we have a, all, for, all parts of the body that are alive create free radicals. The brain in particular, because that's the most physiological active part of our body, the, the eyes being the second most. So just in the normal process of cells breaking down and building up creates free radicals. 
um, glutathione is a, um, a very potent antioxidant. It's the one that's found in the greatest quantity in the brain. And one of the things we're going to talk about is one of the ones nutrients that's found to be deficient in the brain of Parkinson's. Now, to me, that's really critical. Um, and glutathione is called the anti-age antioxidant because it can neutralize the full spectrum of free radicals in the body. That and superoxide dismutase are the two that I know of that can do that. So if we don't have enough glutathione in our brain and our body, those free radicals are going to be attaching to healthy cells and it's going to ultimately cause them dying. Mm -hmm. um, glutathione, you can get from sulfur vegetables, cruciferous vegetables, number of vegetables that, that have it in it, but it's not absorbed that well directly. Um, there are cysteine, glycine, glutamine, alpha lipoic acids, selenium, vitamin C, all help the liver make up more glutathione. So foods that contain protein, foods that contain those nutrients, help the body make up more as well. You can take glutathione as an intraoral sublingual formula. That's a good way to absorb it. Um, we're going to talk about, I guess I can mention IV therapy. Glutathione IV therapy has been very effective in helping reduce um, symptoms associated with, with Parkinson's disease. Got it. And other nutrients that are deficient in the body. I guess we're rolling on here. Yeah, That's okay. yeah, carry on. <laughs> There's a lot of material. There's so much material, you know. So uh, it's a small book, but it's it's really packed with information. Um, our our um, so uh, lutein, DHA. DHA is the uh, essential fatty acid used, the primary one used in the brain. Um, it comes from, it comes by itself. Comes from omega three fatty acids, which can be in the form of fish oil, fish. Um, it also, DHA can come in algae form for those people that are uh, vegetarian. Um, lutein, uh, all these cross the blood-brain barrier, by the way, and are, are critical for, for the retinal health as well for different eye diseases. And so lutein crosses the blood-brain barrier. Again, with these combinations of nutrients cover a broad spectrum of what they do for the brain, how they protect it, how they help uh, the brain produce more brain cells, how they support neurotransmission, which is how the cells communicate through synapse to each other. Uh, trillions of cells do that uh, instantaneously. Uh, I mentioned, I didn't mention taurine, another potent antioxidant. It's, a, it's an amino acid that also crosses across the blood barrier that's found to be deficient, um, as well as phosphatidylglycerin is a critical nutrient for brain health, supports healthy brain function and mood. Um, and that can be found in soy and cheese. And tyrosine is, tyrosine is part of the chain from phenylalanine and tyrosine that's part of the chain uh, of the way the body produces more um, dopamine. So if these are deficient, then also the body's not gonna have trouble producing more dopamine in the body as well. So, um, that's the, part of the nutritional approach is to take a step back and say, what is um, missing? What may be deficient? Lecithin comprises 30% of the dry weight of the brain. Also very critical. That might be deficient. Um, they've also found, and I find this really interesting, that a number of vitamins and minerals, when they're deficient, mimic uh, Parkinson's. So if you're not checking for that, like many of the B vitamins, as well as vitamin D, vitamin E, uh, selenium, magnesium, uh, iron, zinc, iron uh, can be go both ways. If it's deficient, it can mimic Parkinson's. If it's excessive, excessive it can cause um, uh, apoptosis, which is cell death and free radical activity. So to me, you want to do uh, testing of all these different nutrients because what if those are what's causing the symptoms of Parkinson's and, but you're not testing for it, but then you're treating for Parkinson's. Right. You know, big problem. Yeah. That doesn't sound good. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and so again, these are things I discuss in the book, all the different variables of things that are not being looked at for the most part that if addressed may actually help um, manage uh, and prevent Parkinson's disease potentially. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we uh, exercise courses the whole spectrum of all 15 categories, uh, preventing cell death, reducing inflammation. We mentioned, mentioned that chronic inflammation 
also causes uh, cell death. And so, and so that is a common problem now, particularly with autoimmune diseases. Uh, our diet has a lot to do as well with um, onset of auto, autoimmune diseases, things we eat. So I guess we could talk a little bit about that. Um, so an alkaline diet is the, the most healthy diet overall. So an alkaline diet is a uh, is an anti-inflammatory diet, okay. and an acidic diet is an inflammatory diet. So what's alkaline? Green leafy vegetables, all the colored fruits and vegetables, um, even watermelon and lemon actually act as an alkaline in the body. And um, salads, um, there are some. What's uh, acidic are all the everything that's white. You know, white pasta, white bread, white rice, potato, white potatoes. Obviously, sugar is extremely acidic. Meats are acidic. Dairy is acidic. So, um, not that you can't have any of these things, but if you have a strong acidic di alkaline diet and some acidic foods, you'll still have an, an alkaline diet. Got it. Okay. And then, like, barley and quinoa are two um, carb refined carb. Uh, non-refined carbohydrates that are kind of neutral. So that's not as bad as some of the other carbohydrates. But our diet is filled with refined carbohydrates and it's causing, I believe, among other issues, um, you know, people are eating a lot of processed foods, um, are causing an increase in onset of disease. Um, and these are all connected. What's going on in the body affects what's going on in our brain. What goes on in our brain affects what's going on in our body. It's all, everything, all the organs and everything communicate with each other. And they're all dependent upon each other's health. So the things to avoid, um, excess sugar, sugary drinks, even juices, are, are like, almost like having soda. Orange juice has a, a very high amount of sugar. And so those should be avoided. Excess glucose, excess sugar in the body is toxic to the brain, causes obesity, causes diabetes causes, uh, can potentially cause heart disease. It should be um, minimized. Um, if you want to sweeten something, use stevia. Stevia is a great uh, herb. It has actually positive side effects. Helps balance sugar, among other things. Uh, tastes good. Um, so that's one option. Um, um, artificial sweetness, deadly. Absolutely deadly. Toxic. Aspartame and the other ones do not have those in your diet. Uh, they produce, um, for instance, extraphenylalanine, aspartic acid, and methanol. And the phenylalanine and aspartic acid um, are, are toxic to the body and cause um, brain health. And actually, they interfere with the transport of dopamine and serotonin mm. in the body. So we're not only talking about production of dopamine, but talking about the body's ability to move dopamine to different cells in the body, and they interfere with that. Uh, they also cause excitability, so they cause the, the cells to be too excited, which causes death to neurons and astrocytes. Neurons is what, what, causes, what produces the synapse, synapses for us to think and tell the body how to function. Um, and astrocytes are the cell in the body in the, in the largest amounts in the central nervous system. Also critical for many functions, uh, including uh, synapsis, including brain plasticity, homeostasis, which is balancing the whole body out, uh, protecting um, cells, neurons from oxidative damage. So the astrocytes are also... Um, the, um, the aspartame and the, the artificial sweeteners are also toxic to the astrocytes as well. And then aluminum cans. So things that we eat in aluminum, uh, the foods that we eat, the vegetables or whatever comes in there, it's also very toxic. It has bisphenol A, which is BPA, which is an adrenal, an endocrine conductor that can lead to obesity uh, for one thing. Um, and it also, um, oh, by the way, the other things that the, um, the artificial sweeteners do is they build up, they cause a buildup of, um, protein in the brain 
uh, in, particularly the dopaminergic cells and the in the substantia nigra. Okay. So that's you do not want that to happen, and it also interferes with proteolysis, which is um, an action of the body breaking down unwanted protein and unneeded protein. So again, more protein being built up. Um, so aluminum, the, the bisphenol, the BPA from the aluminum is bad. Aluminum also can leach and is one of the suspects as a contributing factor to Alzheimer's disease. Again, very toxic to the brain. Uh, research has shown that high amounts of beef and dairy uh, increase substantially the risk, we talked about prevention, increase substantially the risk of Parkinson's disease. So those should be generally minimized. Some people will avoid it completely. You can have some, they should be. Uh, there is alpha-synuclein in beef, and so you don't want that to cause more build aggregation of the alpha-synuclein in the brain. There's also, if you're not having free-range meats, so there's the hormones and pesticides, that have negative effects. There's also a high amount of iron. So we mentioned where iron may be deficient and mimic part of Parkinson's, but if it's excessive, excessive then it actually produces more um, free radical activity, including reactive oxygen species, which is uh, tremendously damaging, one of the most toxic uh, free radicals, which again, glut glutathione and other uh, antioxidants can, can neutralize. Uh, dairy has poly, polychlorinated biphenols, besides having potentially hormones and pesticides in it. Again, those should be avoided or they should be organic and free range if you're going to eat those. And um, so that's some of the things. We have something called the blood brain, the, um, the gut brain access. So the, the gut and the brain talk to each other and communicate. And imbalances in the gut can, can mimic, of course, brain disease. Uh, functional medicine is one of the more modern types of medicine that a lot of doctors are looking into. And they really focus a lot on gut imbalances as being a source for many diseases. Okay. So that's one thing to look at. Um, did you have any questions before I go on? Um I'd love to hear at some point about Chinese medicine as it relates to Parkinson's too. So we've, we've talked a lot about diet. I mean, you can carry on with what you're talking about, but at some point, yeah, I'd love to hear about that. Well, let's talk about Chinese medicine. Okay. So Chinese medicine has been around for over 3000 years, along with Ayurvedic medicine, which is the Indian partner. Um, there's a lot of correspondences between the two. What's very interesting is a number of chakras match, match very um, critical points in Chinese medicine. No strange, even though they were created in different parts of the world, um, the system. So it's been around for over 3,000 years. Back then, they didn't have any blood tests. They didn't have ways to test things that they do today. So they had to, they had to figure out um, how to treat disease by observation. So we look at the person. We see what the color is, what the sound is, what's the color of their eyes, the color of the skin. How do they sound to us? Uh, what's the shape of their body? We also do a tongue and, 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 um, and uh, pulse analysis. So the tongue is a map of some of the meridians. I'm gonna describe what a meridian is in a second, as well as a pulse. Give us a, a detailed view of what's going on in the body. So a meridian is a map of the body, of flows of energy. And there are 71 meridians that have been mapped out. It's the same for everybody. And every meridian has a different function for how it keeps us healthy. Uh, we typically, most acupuncturists use about 20 meridians as the most common meridians. And then when you get into more, they get to be more esoteric depending on who you may have studied with. So the meridians flow all directions. They go from the feet to the head, the hands to the head, the head to the feet. It's a map that we study in Chinese medicine. And so we're doing the intake we're trying to determine, based on our conversation, our observation, the tongue and the pulse, where those meridian imbalances are out of balance. Because when the meridians are flowing freely, then it maximizes the body's ability to heal and stay healthy. 
when they're blocked, then that interferes with the body's healing. And ultimately we get pain, ultimately we get disease. So the treatments from a Chinese medical perspective for brain illnesses and Parkinson's for instance, is related mostly to the stomach and spleen, the kidneys, and something called the governing vessel. Vessel. The governing vessel runs along our spine from our coccyx up over our head down to the foramen. And there are points along the head that you can stimulate that, again, stimulate healthy brain function and neurogenesis and other things that keep the brain healthy. But then we're going to, as part of the acupuncture treatment, we're going to be looking at other aspects of the body and meridians may be out of balance. So if the stomach and spleen is out of balance, then we may not be breaking down food efficiently and distributing it. If the liver is out of balance, the liver energetically opens to the, to the eyes, for instance, but that can attack the spleen and stomach. There's the relationship. So when you're looking at meridians for different issues, there's often certain meridians that open to different parts of the body that are, that are most relevant, but if other meridians are out of balance, they could be causing that meridian to be out of balance. So you have to look at the bigger picture. So there's something called five element acupuncture, um, wood, fire, earth, metal, and water. And uh, the basics of it are built into all acupuncture. So there's a relationship between the different um, main organs and the meridians associated with them. And we have yin and yang organs. So let's take the liver and gallbladder is, is, um, is related to the wood element. So there's also personality and color. There's a whole map of what each element is. So each we, we all are prone to certain elements, although we can be combinations, but we have a dominant element. So for instance, the wood type typically is um, the account, the, the CEO or the lawyer. They're very driven. And anger is the main emotion associated with liver. And when anger is in balance, it's, it's very productive. It drives people to be productive and to be ambitious. And when it's out of balance, then you can end up with all sorts of problems, including glaucoma, macular degeneration, and, and anger ultimately is heat rising and it can affect all parts of the body. And if it attacks the stomach and spleen, Again, we're not getting the nutrients that we need. So we look at emotions as being, you know, also a factor when we're talking to people. Is there an excessive excitement, excessive joy, excessive sadness, excessive grief? Because that's part of what we want to bring, help bring back in balance through acupuncture and herbs as well. Mm. Um, so there's a fair amount of research on this as well. Those studies are in the book as well as there's over 640 studies, citations in the book that cover all these different areas. Um, uh, we could talk about essential oils. Sure, yeah. Um, but I did want to mention one more thing. It's the, another part of the brain that's affected by um, Parkinson's is the locus coeruleus part of the brain. And that's responsible for a number of things, including the distribution of norepinephrine throughout the brain that goes to all parts of the brain except the basal ganglia. And norepinephrine is a critical neurotransmitter among many that keep our brain functioning and communicating. And so when that's deficient, that also is going to affect our ability to function, ability to think, our mood, anxiety, grief, uh, and also the motor coordination issues associated with Parkinson's. It also is responsible for vigilance and attention and so that can be affected by Parkinson's as well. So um, essential oils, hypochrysum, frankincense, vetiver are two very good ones. Uh, the hypochrysum and the frankincense help reduce depression, which is common in Parkinson's disease. Frankincense, also has, been show, frankincense has also been shown to reduce motor coordination issues Vetiver reduces tremors. And then there's a wide range of essential oils like lavender and lemon balm and bergamot and many more that reduce anxiety, reduce mood disorders, 
help people be real sociable, improve sleep, and many other anxiety, many other things as well. So these can be taken as they can be diffused in the air. Uh, usually it's mixed with a carrier oil. You could put it on the forehead, temples, hands, feet. You could put drops into the bath. But they've been very, very effective in managing many of the symptoms of brain disease for Parkinson's, even Alzheimer's disease as well. Mm, got it. Um, I didn't mention, we mentioned glutathione therapy, uh, light therapy. If you were exposed to, there was a couple studies done, 2,000 to 1,500 lux for an hour a day for two weeks. They found that you can actually reduce the amount of medication you take for Parkinson's 13 to 100%. Wow. So that raises the question, why is this every single Parkinson's patient being given this sort of light therapy? It's also part of the seasonal disorder that people have sometimes in the winter when you're not getting as much sunlight. Um, so we talked about diet, exercise. Oh, exercise. Uh, there, there, there are different ranges of exercise people can do with Parkinson's. Some are more active than others. There's, but water exercise obviously is a great one. Because you, you, uh, the weight is being distributed. It's easier to get around. You can't fall. Um, uh, qigong is wonderful. Or tai chi, tai chi and qigong can be done sitting or standing. So if you can't stand, you can do it sitting. Uh, meditation uh, is very effective again for sleep and mood disorders and emotions, anxiety. There's uh, there's uh, organization that does a lot of dance therapy around Parkinson's. So that's something that one can explore as well. So it's, you do what you can, but exercise, again, of course, is all 15 categories in the book in doing everything. Mm -hmm. And um, so the more exercise you can do that you're capable of doing that's safe for you to do, it's important to do that. And again, if you can't do much exercise, you can do it sitting. Yeah. You know, that works as well. Qigong has uh, been around for 3,000 years as well from the Chinese medical realm, from the Tao, Tao realm. And that's also about helping clear out, clearing out blocked energy as well and helping support health and functioning. Awesome. Well, thank you. It's like the huge comprehensive journey of, of <laughs> Parkinson's care. So I know that you have a, a free ebook for people and we'll also have a link to your book, obviously, below. So is there anything else you want to say about um, where people can for, find more about you and, and learn more about your work? Well, naturaleyecare.com is our main website and that does have our books on the homepage, table of contents. I want people to know that Dr. Grossman and I are both around to help, uh, I do mo a lot of the consultations I'm running the business, and so there's no charge for calling and asking questions or emailing me. Uh, we do that all the time. Uh, for some of the more complicated eye cases, Dr. Mosman will request a eye exam to review. He does have a small charge for that, but otherwise, all the consultations are no charge. And we're here to help. It's really a... Um, as I was saying, it's really about broadening the conversation and trying to take a step back and look at people as more as unique individuals in terms of what may be contributing to their particular problem. And if we can help address that naturally in a healthy way, um, that could result in much greater health benefits for Parkinson's and other health issues. Awesome. Thank you. And again, everyone, there are buttons below so you can click right through to head over to, to Michael's site and, and check that all out. And again, if you remember, we also have had his partner, Mark Grossman on. So we talked about you as well in, in that class. So um, thanks for doing this and for sharing all your insights today. And thank you for doing this as well and having me on. Absolutely. And thank you everyone who's watching or listening right now for tuning in, for showing up for yourself. And we will see you again real soon. Take care. Thank you.